this last Friday, and, the, and there was a five to four majority in the Supreme Court, and it ruled that the 14th Amendment will now require a state to license a marriage between two people of the same sex and to recognize a marriage between two people of the same sex when their marriage was lawfully licensed and performed out of state. So since Friday's ruling, if you've been watching different media outlets of any sort, you've seen a lot of celebration from the gay and lesbian community and those who support it as well. Um, the reason is that because, you know, they have fought for a long time. They fought long and hard to be heard when it comes to recognizing marriage as a union between two individuals of any sex that love each other rather than only allowing marriage to be between a man and a woman. Because of this, you are hearing the now common phrase being chanted abroad, love wins. Because for decades now, the gay and lesbian community has been relentlessly pursuing the right to be recognized by society as, as normal, if you will. And all of this in the name of love. And, you know, we all have something. We all have something that we believe in. And there are things that we all can be very passionate about. And the thing that I have loved most about this country is that our founders, who were, by and large, great men of God, architecturally crafted our Constitution and established our democratic polity in a way that allows us many, many rights. And one of those being the freedom of speech. And it's because of this right that we are afforded the opportunity to deliver to you the message that we are right now. So I, and I appreciate that and I value that greatly. I think most would agree that the best place to begin when faced with moral topics in question is the Word of God. Why? Because it's, it's His Word to us. Though the Bible was physically written by man, it was spiritually inspired by God. If you want to get to know an author and you do not have the opportunity to meet them face to face, the best way to get to know their heart and their thoughts is to read their writings. And that's exactly why He gave us His Word. Though there are some topics in his word that seem gray and undefined and they remain a mystery to us, God has made his thoughts about homosexuality plain and really black and white. And we're not talking about cultural traditions that were meant only for that day and time that they were written. We see a fine line that is drawn plainly so that all would know where God stands when it comes to the gay lifestyle. And I would like to take you on a brief tour if I can, through some of those scriptures. If you're not familiar with them, I'm, we're just simply bringing them to the light for convenience sake to help you know where they are. You can read them for yourselves. You can study them out and, um, and know for yourself what God's word has to say. So we believe that God's word is 100% true from cover to cover. Do you believe that? Say amen. We do. We live it. And you know, each one of us, when we read the Word of God, it's a cleansing agent. The purpose of the Word of God is that we would learn how to cleanse our own life. And so every day when I read it, every single day I ask God, show me what I can change in my own life to be more like you. And so the Bible tells us in, in 2 Timothy verse chapter 3 and verse 16, it says this, All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true, and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. So in any area of life, in any area, in any area of life, when we want to know right from wrong, we go to the word of God. We believe it from cover to cover. So if you have your word, you can open it this morning. We're going to look first at God's God's inspired word on marriage. What does God define marriage as? Not what the Supreme Court defined marriage as, but what does God's word define it as? In Matthew 19, verses 4 through 6, it says this. Haven't you read the scriptures, Jesus replied? They recorded that from the beginning, God made them male and female. He said, this explains why a man leaves his father and his mother and is joined to his wife. And the two are united in one. Since they are no longer two but one, let no one split them apart, for God has joined them together. You can go to Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 and 28, and it says, So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, both male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and he said, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. 
You can go on over to Genesis 2. We're in the very beginning where God lays it all out. Genesis 2, 20 through 24. It says, He, Adam, gave names to all the livestock, all the birds of the sky, all the wild animals, but still there was no helper just right for him. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while the man slept, the Lord took out of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib, and he brought her to the man. At last, the man exclaimed, This one is born, <laughs> bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken from man. This explains why a man leaves his father and his mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united in one. Ephesians 5, 31 and 32 says this, As the scripture says, a man will leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife. The two are united into one. This is a great mystery, but it is the illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. You see, God laid out marriage. You see it, and I could, I could have read more this morning, but we wanted to read just enough. But God laid out this incredible mystery to be a picture of Christ and the church which is a beautiful picture of what marriage was intended to be. Scripture also talks about same-sex intercourse. Uh, look at 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or who worship idols or commit adultery or are male prostitutes or practice homosexuality or are thieves or greedy people or drunkards or abusive or cheat people. None of these, if you're writing your word this morning, underline it, none of these. Notice we're not just pointing out homosexuality and it's not us who wrote it. We're just reading what God's word says. So, so we can't be accused of being judgmental or critical when we're just standing on God's word and saying, hey, we came to Christ as sinners and he's forgiven us. And we stand on his word, and his word is true, and he wrote it. And it doesn't matter what we think about it, because he is the author. He's the author and finisher of our faith. He created us, and he gave us guidelines by which to live. And he says so here, as he says, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. What does that mean? It means these people who practice these things will not go to heaven. Plain as day. So if I'm reading this passage... I'm going to be very, very considerate of any of these things that I've just read because I want to make sure that I am none of these. He says, again, don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or who worship idols or commit adultery or are male prostitutes or practice homosexu homosexuality or are thieves or greedy people or people who get drunk or people who are abusive or people who cheat. Man, he lays it out for us. They will not go to heaven. Some of you were once like that, but you were cleansed. You were made holy, and I was one of them. I was one of them, okay? But now I am cleansed. It says you were made holy. You were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So there are other scriptures, and I'm going to continue to read them, but I can tell you right now plainly, clearly, that if you know somebody who practices the gay lifestyle and they are trying to convince you that, that they can have a relationship with Jesus Christ, I'm telling you, God's word is clear. They cannot. Does God love them? Absolutely. Do we love them? Absolutely. Are they going to heaven if they continue in their habitual sin? No. Just like we wouldn't if we continue in any other kind of sin. And it is a sin. What is sin? It's anything that we think, anything we say, anything we do that displeases God or separates us from him. So God makes it so clear, so clear in his word. When you hear about churches that are, that are quote, homosexual churches, I'm telling you, there's no such thing because God's word is clear. Leviticus 18 and 22 says this plainly, do not practice homosexuality. Having sex with another man as with a woman, it is a detestable sin. Leviticus 20 and 13 says, if a man practices homosexuality, and, and, and mind you, when the word was written, it was written directed towards men because men were the covering of their home, but when it says man, it means mankind. 
it's so it goes for men and women so so lesbians don't kind of get out from under this it's 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 men and women alike if a man practices homosexuality having sex with another man as with a woman both men have committed a detestable act they must both be put to death now it's getting tough for they are guilty of a capital offense so we have to dissect this a little bit does that mean that the church now is going to start executing homosexuals no that's not what it means because we do run into a cultural clause here in this passage because in that day that those were the governing powers that the, the state of Israel or the children of Israel had their own laws by which they lived and God gave them those laws but then when Jesus came right he he doesn't do away with the old covenant but he renews it or he makes it complete or he, or, he, or he fulfills it, if you will. So we're not putting people to death now because Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And, and execution is, is not, it was an Old Testament practice, a punishment, if you would, for people who weren't following the guidelines of God's law. They would also take people out. They would stone them. Uh, many horrible things that they would do to people who weren't following God's law. And I'll just tell you back then, it was a lot easier to live for God. Right? It was a lot easier to live for God if because if children disobeyed their parents, they were if stoned. children disobeyed, absolutely they disobeyed the right their parents, their they children. had the right to take their kids outside and stone them. Now you're saying, what kind of horrible, brutal God would accept such a thing? Well, I'm telling you, God is really serious about sin. I make no apologies. It's 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 His way, and it doesn't matter what you think about it or what I think about it. What matters is what God says about it. When it comes to same-sex marriage, Scripture prohibits what the Supreme Court permits. So, after reading some of these Scriptures, and there, there's more, but just after reading the ones that we've read, um, I can understand how, how many people, as they hear these passages, would become, if they're gay or if they know gay people or support the lifestyle, I know how they could become quickly offended by what they just heard. And my concern for you listening, or you may be in this room, is that you would allow the frustration of what you've just heard to harden your heart or to blind you from sincerely pursuing or accepting what is truth. So I want it to sink in. A lot of times we, we, we kind of grow callous to those things that we don't want to hear. It's like you, it's like you fall in love you know, and, and, and it's like you're so blinded by all the stuff that could possibly go wrong. You just, you, you just convince yourself, hey, it's all right. You harden your heart. You allow your heart to grow calloused. I'm telling you this morning, please, please, please don't look past the Word of God and the truth of His Word, which clearly tells us what God thinks and how He feels about this lifestyle. The purpose of this message is not to debate the interpretation of these passages. Because, frankly, there really is no debate. There's no valid counter-argument. There's no opportunity given for an intelligent, competitive debate if you're going to include God's Word anywhere in the argument at all because He's made it clear. So because of this, we're not going to spend time right now validating the previous references. We simply wanted to make it convenient for those of you who are unfamiliar with some of these passages. So what we want to do right now is I want to show a video that's just basically in a nutshell. It's going to just wrap it all up together as to uh, how now this is going to affect our country. And we knew this was coming because it was prophesied thousands of years ago. Um, and, and, and so we need to educate ourselves as the church uh, as to really, we know how God feels about it. So now how do we respond? And then we're going to wrap up the message with, how do we treat people who are in this lifestyle or support this lifestyle? We're going to cover that. Watch this video first. A lot of people are aware that the Supreme Court is about to hand down a very important decision in what's known as the same-sex marriage case. Most people are expecting that to happen Monday. Uh, whenever it happens, whether it's Monday or Tuesday or even the end of this week, uh, we know it's going to be a major decision. There are a number of different outcomes uh, that could occur there. Uh, but almost every outcome that will occur will cause a real increase in religious freedoms battles across the country. Uh, first, the court might decide that there is a new constitutional right to what they call same-sex marriage. And if this was federalized to a constitutional right, that would create conflicts all across the country, uh, conflicts in particular with religious freedom. Because if there's some new constitutional right, how does that constitutional right stack up against these other constitutional rights like 
the free speech in the First Amendment or religious freedom in the First Amendment. Those things will have to be battled out. And in fact, in other countries where this right has been uh, established, First Amendment rights, free speech, freedom of religion, have actually not fared very well. So there are a lot of ways that this decision is going to go much farther than people are thinking just about marriage. For instance, in the oral argument itself, the justices asked the Solicitor General, well, if we create this new federal constitutional right, does that mean that religious groups, for instance, who hold a different belief and therefore are discriminating under this new definition, will they lose their tax-exempt status? To everyone's shock, the Solicitor General's answer was, that will be an issue. But this is not just about tax-exempt status. It's about everything from the Department of Education guidelines and how those will change in all of our schools. Uh, this is about faith-based adoption agencies and what they will now be allowed to do, faith-based foster parents, uh, homeless missions. I mean, there is literally not a ministry in the country that will not be impacted by this decision. And it goes even further than that. If you uh, run a business and try to run it in accordance with your faith, uh, if you are under Title VII, which is a federal law that controls all employers across the country with 16 or more employees, uh, if you're a part of, uh, uh, let's say you're, you're, you like a broadcaster that you listen to on the air, a pastor or a ministry, well, they have to have an FCC license. Do you think the federal government is not going to question whether they should hold a license if they're now engaged in discrimination against what is now a new federal constitutional right? So you can see the types of attacks that are going to happen very quickly. And it won't just happen in what I just mentioned. It'll happen probably in most professions. Most professions have a statement of, of ethics that people have to follow. And again, in most professions, if you're engaged in invidious discrimination, you can't be in that profession. Whether you're a lawyer or a psychologist or a real estate agent or you could go on down the line. So this is a decision that could impact literally everything in our country. And it's something that we at Liberty Institute are ready for. Our whole purpose is to defend religious freedom. This is actually very ironic. This country was built on religious freedom. The very reason people came here on boats is because they wanted to hold to religious beliefs that were different from the government. The right to dissent, the right to disagree. And now as we circle around, we're back to that very principle again. Will people be allowed to have the right to dissent? Well, that's exactly what we're about to be battling over. And I want to make clear, some people think, well, this battle, this is the end. No, this is really the very beginning of the battle. And I think it's a battle we can win, and we will win. I mean, if there's anything more in the DNA and the blood of Americans, it goes all the way back to that, that idea that there's nothing more American than the right to dissent or disagree with the government and to live out of your faith and conscience with sincerity. That's what we're going to preserve. And I think we can win these cases if we're willing to stand and if we're willing to do the right thing. So I want you not to be discouraged if you see the opinion that many people are expecting to come down. Uh, because from a religious liberty perspective, will this open battles across the country? Absolutely. But that's why Liberty Institute is here. We have our plans in place. We are ready. And as a country, I really think we can preserve this crucial American right, not only for us, but for our children and our grandchildren. So how do we as Christians respond? If you have social media, you've already seen how many have been responding, and we want to help you today to understand how God would have us to respond. You may say, so what's the big deal? We live in a free country. Shouldn't people be able to live however they want? Well, the bottom line is that if we believe that the Word of God is true, and we do, then we know that someone practicing sin is not going to have eternal life in heaven. And if we truly love people, then we truly care how they live. We're not just talking about homosexuality. We're talking about sin in general. As pastors, we give our life to reach people with the gospel message because we care about how people live because we know that life is forever. It's for eternity. The church is not to be condemning. See, we're never going to win somebody for Christ by condemning them. 
We're never going to win somebody for Christ by pointing out all their failures. When you see someone in sin, you don't necessarily walk up to them and lay it all out. And that's what's beginning to happen is it's like a battle going on. We're not going to win them that way. Rather, the Word of God makes it clear that we win people by love. But I want to make it clear to you that love is not acceptance. Love is not acceptance. And so we're going to help you today to understand what the Word of God says, how we're to stand. Just like Kelly Shockerford was talking about, it's time now for believers everywhere to stand up for what is right and for what they believe in without compromise or apology. The Bible makes it clear, if you have your word, turn to Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 2. This is Paul talking, and he says this, Well, then should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? So many people want to say that we're all sinners. We are all sinners saved by God's grace. But this passage makes it very clear that we are not to continue in our sin. So if we are going to continue in our sin, then we are not going to have a place in heaven, just like 1 Corinthians laid that out for us. You see, the Bible makes it clear that Jesus gave his life for the sinner. Go to John chapter 3, verses 16 through 17. And it says, For God so loved the world so much that he gave his one and his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent not his son into the world to judge the world, but to save the world through him. You see, if you go on in this passage, you need to continue to read. It says, we're already judged by our own sin. The Bible makes it clear that one day, every single one of us will stand before God and we will be held accountable for our life and our choices, good and bad. It's not for us. There's no judging to be done. The word of God lays it all out. So it's not about judging. What we need to help people to understand is that Jesus loved them so much. He came to die for my sin and for their sin. It's not about condemning. It's not about judging them. Go to Romans chapter 12. This tells us as believers, how do we live? Romans chapter 12 verses 1 through 2. Dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind that he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Now is a time that believers are are having a hard time standing because when the government steps in and the government begins to say, this is okay, then it's hard for believers to want to stand up and say, no, it's not okay. And how do we respond? But it makes it very clear in the Word of God that we are to be transformed, that we're to be set apart, that we're not to copy the standards of this world. You see, when you, when you see how God established the nation of Israel, the people group that Jesus Christ came through, He set them up and He said, I want you to be holy and set apart. If you look in Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 26, It says, you must be holy because I, the Lord, am holy. I have set you apart from all people to be my very own. See, God wants us to look, to think, to be different. He said it from the very beginning. We're not supposed to blend in and look like everybody else. And that's what God expects out of us. Now, he doesn't say for us to be rude, and he doesn't say for us to be hateful or to be condemning, but we don't have to make apologies for the way that we live our life. When you have surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, you know the favor and the blessings of God that are poured out upon your life. I don't, I don't want to go back to the life I once lived. The, the enemy wants people to be so deceived to say, freedom is doing whatever you want. If you remember being a teenager and you remember wanting that freedom from your parents to just do whatever you wanted because your mom and dad didn't know anything going on, you begin to realize that there were consequences for your bad choices. I mean, I remember the first time I was in a car and I was breaking the speed limit. My mom and dad were not in the car to tell me to slow it down. 
But because I chose to break the law, a siren behind me chose to stop me. And when he did, he chose to give me a ticket for $180 at the age of 18. That was a lot of money. I realized in a very hard way, it is a lot of money. I realized in a, in a very tough way, there's consequences for my choices good and bad. And so that's what we have to learn is that that we are not to, to condemn or to be hateful or to be rude. As Brad said earlier, we all know someone in this day and age that has chose that lifestyle. But I also know plenty more who are living all the other areas of 1 Corinthians. And my heart breaks. My heart breaks because we will see in just a minute, we're going to read you a passage that will show you we're in the end times. I truly believe that Jesus could come at any minute. And all weekend, as, as this ruling came down, our hearts were so grieved because it's one more of the end-time prophecy that's laid out. And I really believe. And we told our kids. And, and for you parents that say this is a tough topic, I want you to know now's the time. Don't. It, it is not the school's responsibility to educate your children. It is not their friend's who are going to educate them on this, it's time for you as believers to sit your children down and to have a talk with them because it's going to be all over our school system. Even kids this weekend with our children, we're talking about this very topic and little children. And so that's why we have, we have no bars with kids being in the room and understanding because when our nation makes something a law, when our nation stands up for it, it's, we're not going to be able to hold our kids in a bubble and keep it away from them. The Bible tells us in 1 Peter 1 and 16 that, again, that we are to be holy and set apart, that because he is holy, we are to be holy. We are all infected and impure with sin. We display our righteous deeds. They are nothing but filthy rags. I want you to think about this. When we condemn other people or when we begin to point out other people's faults and failures, God is saying that the very best we could ever be as, as hard as we try to be the best we can ever be, even our best still looks like filthy rags. And filthy rags, literally, when you study this out, they were talking about leprous wraps, okay? So a person that had leprosy and their skin was bubbly and infected, and they would wrap them with these, with these bandages, if you will. When those bandages would be coming off and all the pus and mucus and nasty that would be all over it, that's what these filthy rags were that he was talking about. And in God's eyes, the very best I could ever be still looks like filthy rags to God, which means not one of us should stand up and pat ourselves on the back as if we are perfect. Every day we are called to get up and try our very, very best to live out the Word of God. Every day we are to strive to live without sin. As Romans 6 said, we don't continue to go on sinning because we think we're going to have grace. But we strive every day to live without sin. And the Word talks about how we're known like a tree is known by its fruit. And, you know, there's a really big difference uh, between trying with all your heart, pursuing that perfection in Christ and trying to be pure and live holy. And your heart is truly, truly just trying to live as, as separate as you possibly can every day. And, and, and your, your, your words and your thoughts and your deeds, they show it. There's a difference between that and somebody who just plainly is living in a habitual lifestyle of sin. I mean, here, here's a great example of somebody who struggles with, with alcoholic addiction. You know, they just continue to get drunk day after day after day after day. When the Bible's made it really clear not to be drunk, but to be pure in thought, to, to make your mind clean and clear and available for God to to have his way in your life. So when, when there's people that commit themselves to this sort of lifestyle day in and day out, but say with their mouths, I'm trying, you know, I just, I, I love God with all my, I pray every day, I pray that he'd take this away from me. You know, Bible says no temptation has overtaken us, such as is common to man, but God is faithful and he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. So for those of you who practice the lifestyle of homosexuality, I'm telling you that the Bible makes it really clear that if you really want to escape from that lifestyle and you want to live a life that is, that is in line with, with holy living and, and, and you're pursuing that perfection in Christ, God says in his word that you can. 
and that he gives you the power through his spirit to overcome the lifestyle so that can never be an excuse for any of us it can't be an excuse for any of us with any sin god gives us a way of escape so i want as we're closing today i i want to um i want to bring your attention quickly back to Sodom and Gomorrah. If you've heard the story about Sodom and Gomorrah, read up on it. This town was was just completely um, overrun with with uh, homosexuality and um, sexual sins. And it was the very reason why God chose to destroy that city. Um, there are other parts in the scriptures where we see God bringing judgment on particular places because of their sin. And you look at Noah in the Word of God and how the Lord flooded the entire earth because of sin. And homosexuality was one of those top, most prevalent sins of that day. And the whole earth was corrupt. And look at how God responded in that situation. He wanted to wipe the map clean so he could start fresh and start all over again. That's what God thought of it then. What does God think of it now? Has God changed? God hasn't changed. His word says that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God will never change the way he thinks about sin. And what's really interesting is that God instituted the rainbow as a symbol of his covenant promise to mankind that he would never destroy the earth again by flood. And look at how this rainbow symbol has been taken to represent a lifestyle that is an abomination to God. And I don't say that condemningly. I don't say that critically. I'm saying it's the truth. It's been used by the enemy himself to represent an abomination lifestyle. And he's perverted and twisted something that God instituted to be a promise to his people to be a symbol of a lifestyle that displeases him. It saddens my heart. And, and, and I want it to sadden your heart. But out of all of this, let me clarify. Our homosexuals welcome at Mountain Movers Church. Absolutely are those who support the lifestyle welcome. Absolutely. We love you. God loves you. We're not going to criticize you. We're not going to judge you. We're going to preach the word of truth as it applies to us as well. Here's what matters most for all of us. Fear God and obey his commandments we have a challenge that misty and i want to put out to you as the church you have an opportunity right now do not engage in foolish debate nobody ever wins a fight did you know that you're not going to win and they're not going to win but you know what will win love wins but not the way they're preaching it god's love wins i promise you you love them and show the love of God in an unbelievable way. And pray, pray each and every day that all of us would turn from our wicked ways, we would turn to God, and that He would heal our land of sin, period. We have an opportunity to really show the love of Christ in this day and time. You have an opportunity to show the love of Christ in an unbelievable way and I pray that you would take that challenge because if we're going to win our world for Jesus Christ if we're going to go into all the nations and baptize people in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all these things that he's commanded we're going to have to get close with some people like that we're going to have to show them the love of God through our actions and not just our words we have to show them that we love them we have to show them who God is by the way we live. So I want to commission a challenge to the church that we would love out loud. But we wouldn't support sin of any kind in any way, shape, or form. This morning I want to pray with you. And then I'm going to give you an opportunity for those of you who are either watching online or maybe even in this house this morning. If you, if you want a real and life-changing relationship with Jesus that is contagious, I'm going to make that available to you. If you would, bow your heads and close your eyes.
Father God, we are in the last days. We're in, we're in times where it cannot become more clear than it is right now. That words, thoughts, and deeds that displease you are by and large the normal thing to do. And your word tells us that we should consider that the coming of the Son of Man is approaching us very quickly when homosexuality is considered normal. So Father, right now my heart goes out to those who have been deceived by thinking this lifestyle is okay and acceptable with you. And Father, we pray for them right now. God, we pray over the gay and lesbian community right now that your love would win. I pray that the the blinders and the calloused would be the, the blinders would be would fall and that the calloused hearts would be broken and, and that they would see your word, Father God, for what it really says. That they would understand you for who you really are. God, I know the enemy is just having a heyday right now because he feels like he has really influenced our culture in an amazing way. And, and though we may have given him an inch, and he may have taken a mile, but Father, I pray that we as the body of Christ would do our part to continue to pray for them day in and day out and those who support this community day in and day out. And I pray that you would just empower us with such a love, God, that it cannot be denied. God, I, I pray against any opportunities for us as believers to be considered, to be judgmental or critical or condemning. I pray that we would be soft-spoken, we would be fragile with our words, and that we would be so sincere in heart and so broken, God, in humility to properly represent who you are and what you expect from us as humanity. Let us be meek, God, which is not weakness, but it's strength under control. Help us, Lord, to be the church that you need us to be in this day and age. With eyes closed and heads bowed, I want to divert this challenge to you today. If, if you would say to yourself, and you'd be honest with yourself and say, Pastor Brad, and I just feel the presence of God. And, and I feel like God's just tugging on my heart. And, and I am nowhere even close to being perfect. And I know it. But I, I want to strive for perfection. Just as God is perfect, I want to I be right there as close as I can with Him. I want to do my very best to please Him in every way. Because I want relationship with Jesus. That's what it takes. That's what gives us that ticket to heaven. It's a real and life-changing relationship with Jesus it's a lifestyle that is in pursuit of holiness and a lifestyle of repentance which is a turning away of those things that we know displease God and we are making a conscious aggressive effort to please him in every way when we have that kind of an attitude man we position ourselves for eternity with him we believe upon the name of Jesus to save us and cleanse us when we confess our sins to him and confess that he is Lord and there is none like him we can have life everlasting this is not our home people this world is not our home there is a heaven and there is a hell 
And my prayer is that you would join me and many others who have made the decision to follow Jesus Christ with an authentic relationship in Him and join us in heaven for eternity with God. That's my prayer and that's my hope for you. If you want that, I want you to accept Him and accept the invitation to receive Him today. I want to pray this prayer with you. If that's you in this place, all heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I'm not going to ask you to come up front. I just want to know who I'm praying for. I'm going to count to three, and I just want you to raise your hand, and I would be honored and privileged to pray with you today, right where you stand. And if you're watching online, the same goes for you. In your heart, I just want you to make yourself available for this decision. Raise your hand. I'm going to count to three. Ready? One, two, three. Who are you today? Amen. I see you in the back. Anybody else today? Amen. I see your hand. And I see your hands online. I want to pray for you right now. God loves you so much. I want those of you who already have Christ to begin praying for those who are making this decision right now. Father, I receive this prayer, Lord salvation as we give it to you if you would repeat this after me I love you God and I thank you for what you have done for me by sending your son to love me and to die for me I admit that there are things in my life things I've said things I've done thoughts that I've had And I know that they've displeased you. And I am sorry. I ask you to please forgive me. Make my heart clean. Wipe my slate clean. Make me brand new in you. Grant me heaven as my home. And eternity with you. I believe upon the name of Jesus to save me. And what he did on the cross to forgive me. And I confess right now that Jesus is Lord. I dedicate from this moment forward that I'm going to live for you, God. I'm going to repent and live out my life in holiness, in pursuit of perfection in you. Help me to understand your word and live it. Help me to make your house of God my home. Help me to make the people of God my people. I love you and I thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to tell you today, if you made that decision, no matter where you are, I want to tell you congratulations because... You have made the most unbelievable decision you could have ever made in your life. And I want to remind you one more time, in case we haven't said it, God loves you so much, and we love you. Um, not only one inflatable, there's going to be a huge water inflatable. So tell all your friends and family, kids, you're going to want to have appropriate looking swim attire please no two pieces okay no two pieces but bring your swim attire we're gonna have an awesome huge ginormous inflatable slip and slide adults could be on it ginormous if that's a word um we're gonna have so much fun seven o'clock wednesday night be here there's also gonna be a horseshoe tournament so all of those who think you can bring it that night be here let's see if you got your game on wednesday night seven o'clock then we need to obey god even in the small things but bring in your tie that's not small He knows that money provides your every need, and he says, I want you to remember that I'm your provider. Are you faithful in giving back to me? Do you trust that I will give back to you? You can text give with your smartphone. It's 918-223-8090. Just punch it in there, and how much you want to give should be 10% of everything you bring in. So this morning, I want you to pray over that.